But when you say small hall boxing, what does that mean? Well, the first thing is it's a place where nobody makes any money. <laughs> I got ripped off really heavy early on. Well, if you do a show at your call tomorrow, so you imagine you want to promote a show, you're talking £20,000 before any boxer gets paid. The worst thing about small world boxing. <sighs> this is the George Groves Boxing Club. I'm George Groves. This is Deck. And this week we are joined by a manager, a promoter, a financial advisor, and a titan of the small hall boxing scene. It's Steve Goodwin. Yeah. Steve, thanks so much for coming on the show, pal. Thanks for inviting us on. That's really nice of you. You're in the club. Yeah, you're in the club. Now, Steve, we've had, we get messages requesting subject matter. We ask for it, to be fair, don't we? We say to people, oh, come on, give it to what do you want to hear about? Yep. I think the most we, we have is people saying, what's small hall boxing? What does small hall boxing mean? We thought, well, who could we get? But we had to get you in because you are, especially down here in London, the small hall guy. Would you, would you agree with that? I think that's You've emerged fair. as such. I think that's fair. I mean, I get labelled as king of the small halls down in the <laughs> yeah. south, but we're a bit more than that, but I'll take any label. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's what we're not. We've, we've been here the longest. We've done the most shows. We've got the greatest longevity. So that's what, if the people want to call us that, that's great. Because mm. small hall, it kind of doesn't sound too uh, sexy or exotic, but essentially it's just because you don't have a TV deal at the moment. Yeah, that's why it ends up being yeah. small. Would you categorise it that way as well, Dave? Yeah, yeah, but that's, a, it's, that's what I always think, but I wonder if there's more to the definition. Like, what would you say when you say small hall boxing, in your words, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, the first thing is it's a place where nobody makes any money. <laughs> Boxers don't make anything. The promoter doesn't make anything and often loses. It's a place where nobody, nobody does it for money. But the promoters do it for the love of it if they're doing it properly. But what it does do uh, is I'm a manager, really, ahead of being a promoter. So the idea is I get my fighters, I develop them, for, develop them through small hall, and then try and develop them onto TV platforms, then get them TV contracts, and then move them forward and forward and forward. And you know, I used it recently with Zach Chelly. I, need, I desperately needed to get him a win to get him um, the, the fight for the British title. So we had nowhere to go. We literally shoved him on a show at your call on a small hall, won that. Next fight was for the British title. So we use small hall as a medium for fighters that are good enough to go for, forward to better and bigger things. But then there are some fighters whose dream or world title is a southern area title. So we also use it for those fighters who really haven't got the ability to go further, but their dream is to, say, win a Southern Area title. So we use it for that as well. Okay. So the, in, in terms of, like, the boxing ecosystem, small hall is, like, the bottom of the pyramid. That Correct. feeds the rest of it. Looks like grassroots, Correct. yeah? Grassroots, yeah, like yeah. the training ground. And, and, the, and the, the good ones, uh, the really good ones, will go through the system uh, and develop through. I mean, we've, I helped promote Richard Comey when he was Legend. developing, and he ended up being world champion. And I helped promote work with his manager through the small hall scene in the UK, winning the Commonwealth title. And then two years later or three years later, he's won the world title. So it does work if you know what you're doing. Mm, that was against Gary Buckland, wasn't it? That's right. Long, yeah, long yeah. Ago. I remember covering it for Boxing News. And I remember that's, that's like the, the beauty of small hall. You've got, you got a Ghanaian guy from Bookham boxing a, a Welsh bloke at York Hall for the Commonwealth title. Yeah. And the, the, the dream is that that gets him up the ladder. And it did. He fight in Vegas for world titles yeah, and, and stuff I've got, eventually. I've got another fighter called Lauren Park who won the European title here three months ago. She's now ranked in the top 10 in the world with two or three bodies. So we're now moving her into a position. So it, I use it as a way of navigating um, fighters through. If I wasn't a manager, I wouldn't do it mm. because there's no money in it. Um, but it does. It, it means I have control over the development of my fighters. I wouldn't want to be a manager asking other small hall promoters to get my fighters on their shows. It wouldn't really work. So I can, I've got the best chance of developing them because I'm a bit, of, I'm a bit OCD anyway, so I, I want total control of everything. I'm a control freak. Yeah. So it enables me to control absolutely everything of the, of the boxer's career. Mm. So you started promoting in 2010? Yeah. And was that your first introduction to boxing? Or was you yeah, doing I mean, basically, then? I was just a boxing fan. And my daughter at the time, she'd just gone through a uh, pretty bad illness and she wanted she had the thing where she wanted to promote and wanted to do it so she was only hmm, what time she did it she just turned 20 when we started but at the age of 18 it was something she wanted to do with me so i done it for her really and the idea was just to do it for a year until the board said they'd give her a license that she'd have to follow me for a year and then i would jump ship 
And I came in to do it. And as you know, and let's be quite real about it, there are some scumbags in boxing, right? There's, there's some good people, but there's some bad, bad scumbags that you wouldn't cross the road to if they were on fire, right? <laughs> so obviously when I was a newbie, they all come out, don't they? They all come out and they think, we got one here. <laughs> and, and obviously in life, when you're, le- when you're learning anything, whether I'm a financial advisor or involved in boxing or whatever it is you do, there's two ways you learn. You either study hard or you learn the hard way and get ripped off. I got ripped off really heavy early on. But it didn't take me quite long, very long to work out who was good, who was bad. So after I, d- I remember doing the third show at York Hall in June 2010. And I thought, I want out of this. I want out of this. But I promised my daughter that she'd promote a show in her own right. And I made a promise. If you make a promise in life, no matter whether it's to your family, to, to anybody, boxers, you keep that promise. That's one golden rule I have. So I had to do it. And I got to the end of the year and she'd done her show. Unfortunately, I was then hooked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was got you. <laughs> it got me, unfortunately. So then I stayed and then I become a manager and I'd done all this other stuff. And to, but to tell, so once I was in, I was in. And then... Obviously, the other thing was, <clears throat> I probably would have given it up, to be honest, but then my son got interested, and he became a boxer. So he'd been an amateur, then became a professional boxer, and then he wanted to work in boxing. So the whole thing became a family thing. Olivia, my daughter, took a sort of step back. she became become a beautician, and she still helps out at shows and still promotes. But it was Josh then's passion that carried forward. So we carry forward now, and we, we work together on it. So mm. it's really become a thing that, we do as a family unit, really. What, what I always find fascinating with, with you guys and the other kind of small promoters and, and managers is that this isn't your full-time job. You do oh, other God, stuff no. for the rest of the day. And this oh, is God, like no. a labour of love. Yeah, I mean, I'm a financial advisor. I've got hundreds of clients. I look after substantial money on the markets. So, you know, I'm, I've been doing that for 30 years and that's my job. That's where I make my money. I definitely don't make my money from this. <laughs> but uh, my wife always says to me, she would be so happy if, I, if we gave up boxing. So happy. <laughs> um, but we don't and we carry on and there's always a reason to carry on. I mean, we nearly, you know, so, but at the moment, I'm back enjoying it again. I hate, I mean, like George, go, I know George wasn't the best, the most, he wasn't, he was a boxer, but he wasn't really into boxing. It wasn't really his passion when he finished fighting to become a manager, a trainer or anything like that. And, I, and it sort of was pretty much the, the same for me but i just have carried on and we're still here and i think we'll be here for a few more years to come mm. what um you said you got ripped off at oh the God, start. Yeah. tell us what that was how did you get ripped off so the first thing first time was i had a boxer for example who because the problem with small hall boxing is that there is no income you've got no income from sponsors and stuff like that now you will see some small hall stuff where there are sponsors but without going into great detail we are we run a 100 percent law abiding setup everything we do is above board and there are there is some money in boxing that maybe isn't above board and so everything we do is literally generated from ticket sales and we tell some boxers sell some so when we started off, I, I sort of realised that was the case. So you put box, we put a show on in Milton Keynes, and there were boxers on the show, and a box would say, "Yeah, I've got, I've sold two hundred tickets, and it's all done and dusted." Then they turn up on the day, and they give you fifty quid and say, "Ah, I lost those tickets. Everybody pulled out in the last minute, so I've only got this." So not knowing what to do, oh, okay, then that's okay. So we just lost thousands and thousands, and in the next show, I had somebody bounce a check on me for the for the money and then and denied that it was him that bounced the check because the check was not in his name and he denied it was him even though I knew it was him and he's still in boxing today how that happened I mean and then the so a boxer bounced the check a, or was boxer, it a manager a manager bounced the check oh, right. on us and then denied it was him that bounced the check although it, we, we knew it was him that bounced the check yeah surely you, that, there's, there's, <laughs> a, there's a trail there yeah, yeah. but the trail wasn't it, it was really weird because the the check that was given, which was given, I wasn't there, wasn't, wasn't in this chap's name. So he then denied it was, it was him, even though we knew it was him. Right, okay. And it was just, it was just weird. So I've had experiences like that. And these are, and there was, you know, there was another one where, where they turned up and literally didn't pay the money that they were supposed to pay. So we'd done three shows. I thought, oh my God, this is so bad. But you identify the bad people. And there are some really 
good people as well. So I don't want to make it sound like everybody's bad. So what you've done over the years, you really work, you're quite ruthless, and you, you, those people that are no good or that are wrong ones, you so you've got them to filter off. out the people who oh god yeah mm. and they're good so we're well we're well on it now so <clears throat> people don't get to work with us if they're wrong ones mm. and we we literally just won't have it and i'm just because i'm not gonna I, I don't want i mean boxing is a headache right but when it becomes a migraine it has to <laughs> they have to go and that's my golden rule mm. headaches are okay migraines have to go <laughs> so small hall shows the income is purely from ticket sales purely solely from ticket sales and what expenses would you have? Well, if you do a show at your call tomorrow, so you imagine you want to promote a show and you've got to allow for your ambulances, your board doctors, the board taxes, you're talking £20,000 before any boxer gets paid. That's the outlay. That's the outlay. Okay. Twenty grand. 20000 You can't get that any lower. That's, that's, and that's you've, done, you've done 160 <laughs> shows now, sure so you know. You, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know you're 20 grand. That's without... That's without production, without if you're going to put screens up, which we do now and again, that's another three and a half grand. Mm -hmm. So you're talking, give or take, allowing for every cost you've got, about 20 grand. So you imagine you're going to your call next week. You know you've got to find 20 grand. How on earth are you going to cover that 20 grand? So you start off with, for, for 14 years, we built up a big client database. So we're for, more fortunate than other promoters in that we have a really good set of people that come back and back to our shows. So we will try and sell tickets, obviously, to the public. So we will sell X amount of pounds. <clears throat> then you put a fight on the show. So every boxer will have to roughly cover the cost of the opponent plus give 1500 towards the cost of getting that 20 grand down. So each boxer out there has got a ticket number to sell, and they've got to try and get it down. So then you've got this 20 grand top level. And you're then, the first thing is, right, how many tickets can we sell? Well, that can vary depending on months of the year. That gets it down. How many fights have you got? That gets it down. Then you've got to hope that um, a boxer can oversell. Because if they only pay the bare minimum in, you're going to lose. So you've got to hope you find a really good ticket seller, one who gets a commission deal above that. And then they somehow get the thing down to level up with 20,000. <clears> and so often it's short. Sometimes you can be very lucky and it goes over, but it, you're really looking at every show normally two weeks before thinking how much am I losing here? Wow. And then you try and balance the books. And then the boxers will go, a oh, boxer shouldn't be, I understand the sort of basics. It's the only sport in which I have to pay to play. It's the only sport in which I have to sell tickets. Why can't the promoter sell tickets? Well, if you imagine this, Fred Bloggs from Chigwell coming on, who's had 20 amateurs, won 10, lost 10. Well, if his mates and family aren't going to watch him, how the am I going to get people in to watch him? <laughs> yeah. not, it's not going to happen, right? I might yeah. get people in to come watch an overnight of boxing. So he's got to build a name up before he generates, generates sales. And like Josh Warrington came through Small Hall up, up in Leeds, but he was very smart. He built up a massive following and he became a TV fighter. And, and in reality, Josh Warrington got to where he was, number one, because he had a good manager in Steve Wood. And secondly, with his ticket sales going through the roof, TV companies wanted to build him. And that's what boxers need to do. Because if they stay as, they don't sell tickets, TV companies really don't want them now. Eddie Earn and all that. Oh, what does he sell? I oh, don't sell a lot. Well, we haven't got, what do we want him for? We'll have, we'll have um, uh, the heavyweight. They've got Johnny Fisher. He'll sell out two and a half thousand tickets at the O2. We want Johnny Fisher. We don't want this guy that sells 50 tickets. Mm -hmm. So that is, it, it, it spills over now to the TV, TV companies as well. Unless you want a British title, um, TV companies aren't that bothered. And even some, even British titles now don't get you a TV deal sometimes. Mm. So because people think boxing, there's just sort of money sloshing around at these shows. And on TV, obviously, they have the TV money that they get mm. paid for each show and they have sponsorship, therefore, because it's on TV. But so for your shows, you, you've got a 20 grand kind of overhead and it's just a race to that, basically. Every yeah, so show basically what happens get... is the mechanics of a small hall show is we'll turn up for the waiting at two or three o'clock in the afternoon and impile a load of boxers that are fighting and they come into the paying room at the end of your call, and they pay their ticket money. So you end up with a bag of money. <laughs> but then, as it goes on through the night, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, every opponent's knocking on the door, everybody's knocking for their money, the doctors, the ambulance, the ring. So the money's there, and it all starts going out again. So the cash goes in, and the cash goes out. It's really, really 
a very strange thing. So you'd look and think, oh my God, they've got all this money. But all you're doing is you've got the money to then go and pay it out again. Mm. You're acting as a sort of a bank, a bank, an in and out bank. And people don't realise that's how small hall works. I remember Terry Stewart, who's he's got all his boxes with us, and he said to me, you must make 20 grand a show out of this. Well, I said, you're crazy. And I always say to people, if you think it's so easy, do one show. Just do one show off your own back and see how much money you lose. <laughs> because it takes a lot. And it's only because of our skills in financial management and we pass it on to our promoters that we work with within our, within our franchise, that we're able to use that number to use to help to get the numbers down. And generally, it sort of balances. It generally balances out roughly at the end of the, the, end of the thing. But you're not doing it for money. Then I go become a financial advisor when a client wants to invest a million quid. Right? So <laughs> really, where should, I, where should I be? My wife says to me, why are you not doing more of that? Because what the hell are you doing this for? It's nuts. Sounds like a headache. Yeah, you were bang on. It sounds like a migraine every time. It just sounds so stressful. Sorry? Every one sounds like pure stress. Oh, it really is. I mean, you've got a show Saturday. So every fight's generating 1,500 quid. You get a f on the way down to London today, my oppo the, the opponent's pulled out. He's not that well. You think, well, you really want that 1,500 because that's probably going to be the difference between breaking even and losing money. So we're frantically trying to find another opponent so that we can generate the 1,500. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it's like. So you do it, which is when I'm doing it, I think, am I absolutely <laughs> meant to? We've done it 14 years now, though. Yeah. <laughs> what has stuff got more expensive in that 14 years? <sighs> yeah, horrifically more expensive. I mean, the board, their charges for everything have gone through the roof, astronomically. Security is now, give you an example from last year, security is up 30% from what was paid last year. That's a lot. Mm. Ambulances are up. Doctors, who used to be paid... 350 and now on 600. So it just, these costs just go up and up. And the venue, I mean, your call now, it's in the last four years, is nearly double what the higher fee was. Has it really? Yeah. Before COVID, yeah. So do you have to double your ticket prices or does that No, not work? we just, well, what we've done, we've increased them a little bit. But what you then do is you work out that the, the boxer that has to pay 1500 used to have to pay 1000 so now each boxer has to chip in towards that extra cost. So they used to cut, have to give £1,000 in roughly. Now they've got to give £1,500 in because the costs have gone up probably 6000 from where they were even just three years ago. Mm. In, with 1500 quid in mind, is, uh, is each boxer needs to get that. How many tickets, like average, what do they need to sell? To so if you've, got, if you've got a four-round boxer and he's turning, up, he's turning up on Saturday night, he really needs to sell about, about 58 tickets before he even earns anything. Okay. That's not an easy thing to do. No, that's hard. To do. Yeah, that's hard and to that's sell bare minimum. They only sell 40. They don't fight because they're not even covering the cost of their fight. So it becomes, and then you end up with a show. Very rarely you get 10 fights because what the board did, I don't know if you know this about your call, when COVID started, they used it as a, we used to have 18 fights on a show. Yeah. The idea was you could then get your money out of it. The board then restricted shows around the country to a maximum of 12 fights. But your call's only 10. It's the only venue in the country where they only allow 10 fights. Is that your call's rule or is that the board? No, the board. And they will not. They've given various reasons as to why they've, but they've obviously got an issue with your call. Changing room's too small. Well, the changing room's really <laughs> needs gutting, as we know. <laughs> but no, they just say, um, you're lucky that you're allowed to stage boxing at your call. It's not fit for purpose. We don't think you should have boxing there. And therefore, you've only got 10 fights. So what's happened is the fights we get on now, you're squeezing it so narrow that each boxer now is getting a bigger responsibility. Whereas if you stage a fight, say, in, I don't know, a leisure centre in Mansfield, you haven't got the same cost. You're probably looking at 11,000 to stage a show because you've got a lot more, there's a lot more cost down here. So it's very, very difficult. But what happened, the reason we do your call, we have found that when we have tried to do shows elsewhere, our customer base don't buy. Mm. So if we go elsewhere, we lose all of our customer base. Oh, so that's why you need to stay at your goal. Yeah, mm. because we, if, without our customer base, we couldn't do it. We would have to stop because we'd be, we'd be losing so much money every year. My wife would have, that would be it. <laughs> I'd be done. She so sounds like the financial advisor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> As we know, I mean, I operate the 95-5 rule, which is 95% of the time, what she says goes 5% of the time I have my own say. That's Saturday but, night. And I think it's the same, yeah, but I think that's the same. But, but if we were, at the moment, boxing is within the 5%, but if we started really hemorrhaging money, it would form part of the 95%. Mm. So you say that 
you now you like to manage the fighters you yeah. you promote. Um, and you've managed some some big names along the yeah. way, and they're much bigger than you know non TV your call yeah, shows. Yeah, I mean, I've managed Nicola Adams when she won the world title. I managed Derek Chisora for for two years. Yeah, that was that. a bit of an event. Um, <laughs> I managed Frank. I've I managed, and I also have managed a lot of boxers whose career was down in and out. And I have recovered Frank Bullioni. I took from when he was he finished with Frank Warren and I built him back up to British champion and everything else. Wally Camacho was retiring. I took him back and we won the Commonwealth and we went back to um, fight for the British Commonwealth against the Coley. That was his uh, final final thing. But I built him back when he was written off. So my management skills have been really good at not only building from scratch but also building a fighter's career back up. And at the moment, I'm looking after Zach Chelly, who's just become British and Commonwealth champion. And I've got Lionel Shadovia, who's been a bit unlucky, but we're hoping to build him back to that level. That's the bit that I really enjoy, is where you... Yeah, I was going to say, what is it that you like it? Like, like what's the fun bit? That's well, the, that's the fun bit. Yeah. That's the fun bit, where when Lauren Parker won the English, or the European title, and that was, a, that was just such fun. When, when Brad, who's now won his Southern areas, won his English... He, get, he, he went wrong for him against Tyler Denny. He didn't turn up. And we got him back to a British title fight. For Brad, that's his dream. So you've delivered a fight to their dream. And it's an, an ability, as you know, I mean, your ability was world level, but not all fighters are as good as you. So if, if their level is British and the dream is British and you can deliver that, it's an amazing feeling. And, when, and if they win, it's an even better feeling. And it, you're helping them achieve that. And I, that's the buzz. That's the buzz I get. Mm. So would you go to a... Are you in work mode? Or the same sort of work mode. If you're going to some maybe someone else's show, but you've got a fighter who you manage on the car, can you go there and just enjoy it, relax? Or have you got to have your wits about you because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's odd. Yeah, I don't feel um, I don't ever relax when I've got a fighter on. I don't I don't actually go to watch boxing if I'm not um, if I haven't got a fighter on. I don't I don't bother. I'd rather watch it on telly. So, but I, I go to boxing when we have to do some of our shows. And to be honest, some of our shows that we're involved in are absolutely pretty ropey. And then because you're building up client fighters' resumes, and sometimes they can be a bit better than they look, and then some fights you might have five title fights on, they're brilliant. They're just, it's really, that's an enjoyable experience. So, you know, enjoy watching the fighters, watch them develop. Um, but yeah, going to other people's show is worse because I'm not in control. And, and it, um, I always say I'm a control freak, so I hate not being in control of anything. So therefore, you're not in control of everything. As you know, when you're, You've got to make sure that other oh, gloves right, this right, that right. And so therefore, that's quite a don't like it really. Mm. But I have to do it on the on the subject of control. One person who's very difficult to control is Derek Chisora. How did that come about? <laughs> I remember when I remember seeing that press release, and it was like, I was like, okay, it makes a lot of sense. But what it was just a bit of left field. What happened there? Yeah, I'll tell you a couple of stories that I've never really told in public. I tell them all. <laughs> I tell them all over dinner, and people <laughs> laugh, but I will tell you them. I've never said them before. But a couple of them I can say, and um. He, he came to me and he said, they said I wanted to manage me and I said, oh, I don't really want to do this because <laughs> I, don't need, I don't need the money, right? It's not, where, where was he at this point of his career? He was mm -hmm. sort of in limbo land going nowhere really. It was after he'd lost uh, for the European title out in Monaco. Yeah, I'd it? managed him at that point. It was before, so it was before so that? It was before that. Okay. It was before so this that. is after Hay, after the Hay fight? After the Hay, well after the Hay fight. Yeah. And um, I managed him for the first Dylan White fight. Right. And... Um, that was probably the second fight I had for him. So the, the Dylan fight with the white fight in Manchester. And it's true story, this is a true story. I mean, this was like, uh, by the way, I thought, uh, he's just, he, he is, Derek is Derek, right? Mm. So anyway, I'm working seven days a week at this point, right? So I'm, I'm, my financial business is, is so busy. My boxing is like, the boxing is so busy. I've got him fighting um, up there. And I also had Frank Bullioni fighting, um, Hosea Burton for the British title on the same card. So I had both of them up there. So I said to my wife, look, Thursday's the press conference. I can get away with not going to the press conference. Um, so what I'll do is we, will, um, we won't go to the press conference um, and I'll go up late Friday afternoon. So what we're going to do, Thursday night, Friday morning, we're going to have some time to ourselves. I haven't seen you for six weeks. So I'm going to do, as we all know, we don't want women getting too upset with us. We've got to try and do a little bit right. So he said, okay, no problem. 
So anyway, so on the Thursday, I'm thinking, I'm just planning to sort out, go out with my wife and stay overnight and blah, 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 and then drive up to Manchester in the afternoon. And I hear that Giselle's thrown a table. Oh, yeah, that one. So I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. Then Robert Smith rings me up. He says, you need to get to Manchester. We got a hearing first thing in the morning. The fight may be off. So I said to my wife, I said, I'm really sorry. This thing we planned for so long, <laughs> I can't go. I've got to go to Manchester. Did she throw the table over? <laughs> no, <laughs> she wasn't. Did you show her the video? Really, she's actually such a good woman. She's, she's, <laughs> I always say, you know, she's, I've been with her 37 years. She's, she's wonderful. I couldn't want any better, but okay, it is what it is. Off you go. So we go up the next morning and we go to, um, go to Manchester and we go to the, um, go to the hearing. So there's me. Eddie Earn, the board. So they start reading the right act to him. And as they're reading the right act to him, you can see him getting agitated, right? So I'm thinking, I've got Eddie there, and I'm thinking, he's going to go. He's going to go off. So I said to them, can we just have a break? Can we have a break? So no problem. So I take Derek out. I said, let's go down and sit in the cap at the end of the thing. So I sat with him, and I said, look, Derek, my wa- I haven't spent any time with my wife. I said, I've had to come up because you flipped the table. I've had to sit here with you this morning. I said, I said, I've now got to go home and deal with the wife afterwards. And you've just gone and done this. And now you're about to go again. And he just looked at me and said, that's what happens when you deal with the insane. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, okay, right. So we got through that fight. So then I thought, look, Derek could probably manage himself this could be a really good idea that he could look after himself so i said um let's go and have a so afterwards i was meeting frank bullioni for we were celebrating he knocked out Isaiah burton so i went to Hampstead garden suburb was going for real says derek let's meet up and have a coffee so i thought look i'm going to give him the chance to manage himself now because this might be a good idea and beneficial for everybody so now i class myself as quite smart so I thought I need to, with Derek to sell him the idea, and he might want to buy the idea, that he should manage himself. So I explained to him that I felt guilty taking the money, and um, really I think he can manage himself, he's so good, da, 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 da. he doesn't really need me. Da, 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 da. So I sold him the sales pitch for 20 minutes on why he should manage himself. So he turned around to me and said, so what you're saying to me is, um, you feel guilty taking my money and I should do it myself. I said. Hundred percent. Okay, he said, I've got a perfect solution for you. I said, What's that? Stay as my manager, I'll give you a fifty percent pay cut. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm out of the cash <laughs> thinking I've just given myself a fifty percent pay cut and I'm still doing the same job. Can't negotiate with the insane, yeah. that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. He was very smart. He told me how smart he'd be. Mm. And so there were, there were stories like that. So but it was in the end that um in the end it was really a point where it, it was a hot, it was just, I think if you want to do, if you really want to be a manager and you want all the headaches and the trouble and you want the money, you do it. But for me, it wasn't about, I don't do it for money. So that was just a migraine. And, you know, I wished him the best. And in the end, we decided that was enough and he's carried on. And he's done really well since and made himself a load of money. So good luck to him. But, and, and to be honest, what I, what I do think, looking back at it, it was really good for me because I learned so much dealing with Derek and, and, and the, the issues that we had to deal with. It was really, really good. So when I look back, it was a really good experience, and um, but but it was it was fun, and but it was also you know all that sort of stuff. You never knew, you know. He'd go to a press conference, and we'd done a deal, and um, and he um, and he would then just turn around and go, "I'm not going to talk at the press conference. You give me another fifty grand." And <laughs> so you were then having to deal with that sort of stuff, and that was all the time. It was yeah. all the time. But he, you know, he, he used to get he used to get what he wanted. Mm. It works for him, doesn't it? That's, yeah. that's a story of a, of a fighter maybe giving you a few headaches. Have you got any stories about promoters giving you headaches as, in your management role? I've got to say, um, going, through, going through them, Eddie Hearn has always, 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 always kept his word. Whenever he's, whenever he's due to pay a fighter, he's paid them. Whenever he said he's going to do A, he's done A. So I haven't dealt with Eddie for many years. But I never, ever, ever had any any problems with him ever, mm. and um, we're dealing with Sky at the moment. I've had no problems with them. I had a few, I had a few, I had a few things to deal with when I was dealing with Sal and with Brad and Linus, 
but it wasn't that bad. It was just what, you know, promoters are trying to, have got their agenda. You're representing the box who's got their, what they want to do. And sometimes it doesn't mix. So you have to navigate in the middle of it and, and deal with it. So that, but it's still a bit of a, still a bit of a headache. But generally, haven't had too much of a, too much of a problem with promoters. They've all been all right. Say you've got like a really, someone turns up and they're really good and you're like, wow, this guy's good and he sells loads of tickets. Mm -hmm. Do you tout them about to the major promoters or, or do they have like talent spotters? Like how, do, how does that? No, you would, you would ring up and you would, you would talk to them. I mean, the thing at the moment that, um, that's happening out there, if you look at Sky, for example, they're not signing anybody. So they're not, they're, they develop the odd, you know, they'll sign, they've signed Fran Hennessy for whatever reason. Uh, but if you look at what they're doing, they're not actually signing anybody. And Eddie at the moment is signing the odd one or two, but unless they've got something totally outstanding in terms of financial gain, he's not really signing anybody. So the, Frank's signing up a lot of the, um, the, the ones that are coming through underneath there. The, the, but there's not a lot of signing going on. So at the moment, the way I look at it, you've got to develop the fighters until they hit the English-British level. Because if you've, if you've got an Olympian, they'll sign them. But if you've got somebody that's won an ABAs or whatever, you know, that sort of thing, that's not enough anymore. So they're looking for the odd quirk rather than the real solid pro that would be a British champion in time. They're not that bothered at the moment. That's why I found a massive change in the last few years. Mm. They would spend the money developing them, but they're not really. If you, you take Sky, they're not developing that many fighters. They've got the Ben Whitaker. Um, but they're not really spending a lot developing. They're looking, for making, they're looking to make fights now rather than spend a lot of money developing a lot of them. Does that make your life easier or harder? Harder. Really? Because you haven't got an outlet that you used. The outlets that you used to have are not there. And if you're not going to get the real top-notch fighters coming to you, the top amateurs, they're the only ones they want. So I, I don't tend to get the top amateurs for scratch. I will tend to get the ones that, just below the top, and I'll often get the ones coming to me who want a career resurrected, like Zach Chelly, who was helping to rebuild back again. He's quickly won the British and Commonwealth. Mm. So I tend to get that. I'm like on a recovery mission of sorting out a problem or getting the ones that are just not good enough to be signed by the TV promoter but, but need really good management. So it, I'm sort of, I'm in the sort of catch zone. So if they were signing fighters, there'd be a lot more opportunities for, mm. for mine. Yeah, so if you have an ABA champion, he wants to turn professional, or she wants to turn professional, what would be like some advice that you'd give them off the bat? And obviously, even if you wanted to work with them, how would they build themselves so to, what you to would, make it in the program? So what you would say is there's two things you've got to do here. Because you're not good, because realistically, you're not going to get signed by these big promoters at the moment. And what I mean by the big promoters, you're talking... Um, I class the main two promoters as Eddie Hearn and um, Sky. Frank Warren is a top promoter, and I'm not going to, but obviously um, they tend to sign quite a lot of them. So it's not really the format. I like a promoter to really get behind a particular fighter, and, and Frank will sign loads and push the ones that he really likes. And I mean, he's a brilliant promoter, Frank Warren, at developing fighters. So he's got that aspect, but not all of them get pushed to the same, at the same way because he's, he's cherry picking them. But I want to promote if they sign them to know it's going to be a, they're going to do everything they possibly can. So I say to a boxer, you've got, two, you've got two things here. You've got to fight and win, but you've got to develop your brand and commodity because you've got to be a marketable commodity, you know, something that's worth selling because if you're not that, it's not going to happen. So you've got to develop inside the ring, outside the ring, get a, football fan base develop 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 and get big big support and ho locate a football team you're going to be able to you know lo you know look into like josh warrington did and that's really what you've got to do so i'm afraid you've got two jobs here the marketing which we can help you with a bit and the fighting but one without the other is not enough anymore it's got to be both mm. so that's changed in the last 14 years that you've oh, been doing it really. yeah yeah tw oh god yeah 10 12 years ago you'd be able to get your fighters that are selling a few tickets get them on a TV platform fairly easily. It's so difficult. I mean, I, I mean, I got, for example, I, when Florian Marku came to the UK, I developed him. So I basically took him, helped him build his profile, and then he went on to 
Um, this is a problem management. So then I got him, we got him all the deals. I had a deal on offer from Sky. I had a deal in on uh, Eddie Hearn, Warren. And then Sam Jones went and nicked him. <laughs> so, and then took the, con- the contracts already there. And, it, and I did on the time. But I had no problem with flooring. So we only had a one year deal. And he offered to pay me a shitload of money. But Sam sold him the dream. And basically, and I'd like Sam, so I've got no issue with Sam either. But he done what, he done what people do. That, that you know, somebody does the work, you take it over, and and um, t- this is how boxing is, isn't it? But I had a Florian didn't do anything wrong with me. He saw out the contract that we had, and but obviously I'd done all the work there, and it looked as if I didn't do the work, but I had done the work. But the point is now, I've got another Albanian who sells the same amount of tickets, who I think is better than Florian Marku. Um, guy called Dennis Balazzi, who I think is, he will reach higher levels. But they won't take him. They're not interested. But yet, with Florian, they were all clamouring to sign. So it's a totally different mentality from the TV promoters at the mm. moment. And it makes it much more difficult for me. Because a fighter who can sell tickets is essentially more valuable to a small hall promoter than he is to a uh, the TV promoter obviously they want to sell tickets and it to look good on TV but essentially they're not under pressure like you know, the guys who are working and only making money from ticket sales so yeah you're right because they've got the money but you should still be creating a spectacle like what they're doing with Sky have got that show with Wardley and Clark that'll sell well they're doing a really good job with marketing that fight it's Easter got- Sunday though yeah it's got to be a hard sell yeah, possibly that might be the risk, but it's gonna. I know a lot of people that are going mm. that would never normally go. Yeah, but 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 from, from what you're saying, it's yes and no. But I think they should be looking at boxers that are going to fill out arenas, even if they put them on the undercard and put them on towards the end of the night to try and fill it out. When if you're watching a product from home, and I was watching the Baru Eggington fight, you're looking and thinking, what a sad thing. This is a brilliant fight, and you've got an empty arena. Yeah, it was empty there. They didn't they didn't sell a lot of tickets and um I'm not sure why it was in, in, in Telford. Telford. Yeah. But it was supposed to be in Telford, I think, because the the that was supposed to look good on TV, but what was missing was People. a load of faces yeah. <laughs> in the crowd. <laughs> yeah. Which is a real shame. Mm. Um it might be tough, you know, Friday nights. But it is tough to, it's tough to sell tickets and shift tickets and maybe if that was a small hall show, that show wouldn't have seen the light of day or been pulled because they hadn't sold enough tickets, but with the TV support, it can get over the they line. They can go over the line, exactly mm. that. And, um, but it doesn't make it, it just doesn't make it a great spectacle. And mm. I think promoters, even at the higher level, I mean, Eddie Hearn's got it. He's, he's got it pretty spot on. He's, he's, the smart, he's smart, he's been doing it for years. He, he gets the ones on to make sure that pretty much the, the venues sell well and he, he does good marketing with it all. So I think he does a fair job. And I think Sky are developing. I mean, obviously got a new Ben Shalom is pretty raw to say the least, and hasn't got the, the wealth of boxing experience that someone like Eddie Hearn has got. So they've got good people behind him, John Wishhausen and people like that. So hopefully that will help them develop their way through. And Because John Wishhausen is probably, in my opinion, the, um, the best person in boxing, the most knowledgeable person in boxing. He's a man who's seen it, done it forever and ever and ever. And he just sits behind the scenes and orchestrates everything. Mm. And um, he's actually the man that device price fighter i didn't realize that till today he was the one that came up with the whole idea of price fighter and uh, so it's all so it is it is actually true that that they are looking but it but it is also important that if you look at when we talk about ticket sales if you look at the zach Chelly, um uh, callum simpson fight zach isn't as you know zach isn't a big ticket seller but he's got a lot of talent simpson has got a big following up in in yorkshire so sky will have a balance here do they put Zach is the champion, but Simpson will drag more crowd. So do they put it up here? Does Simpson end up getting the advantage of the fight being closer to his hometown because he's got the better, bigger support? He sells hundreds and hundreds of tickets. So the bigger the ticket seller, the better the leverage you have to decide where to, for the TV companies to decide where it goes. Yeah. So ticket selling is still important. Yeah, it's, like, it's like Chris Billum Smith against Richard Briakpour, for instance. Like, why would you take CBS out of Bournemouth? And he can sell, he can fill the stadium, let alone he arena. Gets, he gets a big advantage. Yeah, he? whereas Reactable don't really sell any tickets. So therefore, that's yeah. what you're getting. So there is, the, the ticket selling sort of matters, but I get what you're saying. It doesn't mean as much to the bottom line, but it matters in terms of where the fights are staged, mm. what the advantage is, and 
stuff like that. And uh, I think I think it, it, you know going to a boxer's hometown, as we know, like Maya did when she went with Natasha Jonas, makes it a lot more difficult to get that decision. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a, a valuable thing for any fighter. Like I remember being an amateur and already trying to sell tickets. You know, sell five hundred plus maybe more for your call for the aba finals you know yeah. just so the promoters are there going oh we'll back this kid you know and uh if you're an olympian but you don't sell tickets after a while you're just going to become an expensive asset mm. you know exactly. but if you're an anthony joshua who's always sold tickets then you'll always be busy you, they'll always be willing to keep you busy um Lawrence Acoli, who didn't sell tickets, had to go to Bournemouth to defend his world title because Chris Billum Smith sold sold in Bournemouth, mm. um, and he got that home advantage. It might have, well, it certainly would have helped him, wouldn't it, on the night? And he, he gets the win. Mm. So it's uh, yeah, it doesn't matter who you are; you could be the, the best fighter in the world. You got you got to put bums on seats. But you did all right, didn't you? Selling to, you, you yeah, yeah, we sold, we sold 80,000 at Wembley once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that's different because then you get to that point where, yeah, you're not locally selling tickets. But at the start, you know, obviously my debut was at the O2 Arena on a Hay undercard. So I had that, yeah, come and watch me and watch David Hay. Know. So like if you're if you're small hall and that no one on the card is a big name, then you literally people Just are coming me. to see you and mm. then yeah. they might see you and leave. Um, so I had that, but then I think my second fight was at your call on on TV, you know, so luckily I had it banked already from the amateur days from like going through the contact list, getting on people, you know, people who you knew love their boxing, you get into them because you know, they will sell not, they're not just going to bring him and his brother or him and his wife, or him and his mate. There'll be 10 of them coming. It's an art to it. We had Josh Warrington on, didn't yeah. we? Who to 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 that yeah. Josh Warrington said that there were times where he sold yeah. Four tickets. Four tickets. They all went in the same car. They went in the same car. And mad. then he, he sells 10,000. Yeah. yeah. Because 000. the development's been fantastic for him. They've mm. they worked out how to do it. But he worked hard with it. It wasn't yeah. as easy. It wasn't just, oh, attach yourself to a football no, team. No, no, no. That's he, not enough. He was obviously lives and breathes that football team mm. like Ricky Hatton did with Man City. Um, you can't just, like, I saw James Legale once in a QPR shirt because his, uh, his cousin was at QPR, but actually he was Arsenal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that was Warren or maybe Warren's team. Richard Maynard. Yeah, that Richard was, Maynard. That was a Maynard, Maynard classic. You've got to yeah. have a team. <laughs> David Hay, um, Millwall, like, because he was from Bermondsey. He's, I don't think he's ever seen a game of football in his life. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, a, he, he was the king of marketing. Yeah, yeah. Like, what maybe. a tremendous ticket seller. Yeah. You know, he didn't need that football crowd. No. But I'm sure plenty of the, the uh, Millwall lot came, supported him, and thought it was one of, his, one of their own. Yeah. On your call, how many tickets are there in there? 1250. 1250. Would you ever sell, can you sell more than that? Because you know people, you can't do that. Because you can't put someone on at 4 p.m. And then, well, you can, but your problem is you've, do you imagine, I mean, I remember when, Matchroom used to do prize fight. They used to fill it up with about 1,650 people in there. And just hope people, people leave. Yeah, but they were. They were stuck. Yeah. I remember once, they were stuck to the walls. Yeah. Mm. So the problem you got is you've got two issues when you do that. Well, number one, you get a fire in there. Not only are you in trouble, whatever you've got in the world could be attacked. So you can't afford to do that. So you just sell, you just sell the number of tickets. I mean, you can gamble. People could oversell and gamble on people leaving and hopefully being replaced. But if they don't leave... And you've oversold in there, and something goes wrong, then mm. you're in a lot of trouble, aren't you? So twelve fifty, then what's the max you can earn there? Well, the most you can take in, if it depends on what you, what you sell. We're quite the cheap on prices. Yeah. We do we do fifty quid and seventy five quid at ringside and stuff. So you know you could bring in if you, but you don't remember you don't get all the money because the boxers are taking some of the money because uh, yeah. ticket deal. So the promoter's never going to see that. Promoter might end up seeing twenty five grand of it. Yeah. And yeah, then so, gro get, so gross if you put. If you sell a thousand of those tickets for fifty quid, there's fifty grand coming in, and but then you don't see the fifty grand because the, the boxer keeps a lot of it for their deals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The opponent, so well, no, even with the but the boxer will be taking more of that a lot of the money. So the chances are you end up with about twenty five grand if you're lucky. You've got a twenty grand expense, and you bank you bank a five grand if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. but often it can be less than that because boxers undersell. Don't you know? Don't yeah, do it. that's the best case scenario. Pretty it's much, like you're pocketing on the about whole. five grand. Probably, yeah. yeah that'd yeah. be that'd be a phenomenal night. Really, yeah. Could you could you sell so, an afternoon session and then an evening session and then a night session? I did try that, you know, with because that way, um, 
I tried to get the board to allow us, because when they went down to 10, I said, well, we'll we do an afternoon show and an evening show, because then a lot of our costs would remain constant. But they just weren't, at, they weren't overly keen on really? allowing us to do it. Yeah, because I thought, well, if you start a show at 1 and finish at 5, then start another show at 7 and finish at 11, that can work. Yeah. And the two separate shows, you clear it out, Double thank bubble, you very much, yeah. goodbye, yeah. and have an evening show. But they, they, they weren't over enamoured with doing it. But you see, it was, yeah, I mean, I just, oh, we can't staff that. And da, 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 da. so I'm not saying I couldn't go back and try and do it, but yeah, they weren't overly keen mm. on that. In, the, in a nutshell, just the last, and you've covered both, but just sort of brief answers. The best thing about small hall boxing, what is it? The atmosphere at York Hall when, when there's a really good title fight on English title, Southern area, European title, when you're staging it at small hall. And it's not like the big show. It's ra- and it's rammed. And, and for those fighters, it means everything in the world. Watching those fights, some of the best fights at that level, better than TV fights. So the night when you're watching that fight and you're watching an absolute amazing fight that you'd pay a lot of money for. Mm. And worst? The worst thing about small world boxing? <sighs> the, fact, the fact that you're being screwed financially from everybody all <laughs> over the place. <laughs> and and nobody gives a toss that the, the small world promoters getting screwed. Mm. That's also pretty fair. Yeah, I mean gonna... that must be hard to take as a financial advisor. That must be. But I have a choice. I can walk away. Yeah. yeah. And that, and the board will always say that. Don't like it. Walk away. Mm. Yeah. So at the moment, um, we haven't walked away. But I would I would probably say this, and I would be, and he's sitting over there. If it wasn't for my son, I'd probably have walked away. But it's only because he's committed and loves it as well. And when we do shows, my wife and daughter are involved as well. But, but if it wasn't for Josh, I think I'd have walked away. Josh allowed to do anything, or are you a control freak? And you, no, he's allowed to do. Managing him. <laughs> he's allowed to do. He's allowed to do a few things. He's, yeah. No, he's 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 doing everything. He's qualified as financial advisor as well. Yeah. So he's following in in our footsteps. He runs he runs shows himself as a promoter. He's he takes over sometimes when I can't go. He'll he does a lot of the management stuff. He deals with a lot of the boxers. The boxers love him. Yeah. He's very good with them. He's super smart, so he can do everything. He can do everything I can do. Mm. Just needs a bit more experience on the financial side. You're not supposed to admit that, though. <laughs> <are you? laughs> I'm honest. Yeah, I always tell the truth. Um, Do you have a break there? Yeah, you got a feature. I've got the best feature. The best feature. This is really, really good. You're gonna love it. Okay, let's have a break. I'm George Groves. He's Deck. And if you haven't heard, the George Groves Boxing Club is going live and tickets are on sale right now. Nice, our first ever live event, George. Are we gonna start off on a nice low key venue? Absolutely not, no. We are taking on the world famous Shepherd's Bush Empire and it is Frotch Groves free. It is 10 years deck since mine and Frotch's fight at Wembley Stadium. So I've gone and got Mr. Frotch to come down all the way down to the Shepherd's Bush Empire and we're gonna tussle it out again in podcast form. Nice, you could get the bus there again. Should we brainstorm a few other ideas? So it's gonna be uh, the feature and it will oh. be the best feature we've ever done. You, yeah. Maybe you and Carl could have a duel. We'll be crowdsourcing. For the, for the most Mike part. Skinner's coming, he's crowd surfing. 50 Cent's gonna buy the first three rows anyway. I don't think we could promise this. Frotch Groves Free, a decade in the making. Tickets are on sale now. Listen to the George Groves Boxing Club podcast for all the details. Right, we're back. We're back. So, Steve, every week we have a feature with our chosen guest. Uh, this week's feature is actually a quiz. That makes, makes <laughs> it's a change. quiz. <laughs> right, so uh, it's UV Deck in our oh, quiz. Who? Are you up for this? Go on, then. All right, so the name of this week's quiz is... I'm going to bring back Q Jingle, right? Yeah. Who dares... Good wins. <laughs> 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 yeah, so uh, I just, I've got a quiz about guys, fighters who have um, maybe dared a little bit within their boxing career and then sometimes it's paid off, sometimes not. So I've got a series of questions, mate. Is UV deck? Do you want to go first or second? First. Right, okay. Right. Just a straight up quiz. Question, answer. Straight up, yeah. Straight up, up, quiz, question, answer. Quizzes. Right. Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> so Curtis Woodhouse. Right, he dared to quit football to follow his dream and a promise he made his father uh, to win the British title, right, which he achieved in 2014. But which ECM elite club member did he fight in his final bout three and a half years later? His final fight. 
Curtis Woodhouse final fight. I can't, I don't know. No Can idea. I, I have a go? I know it can't be Poochie. It's Poochie. Yeah. <laughs> was he? He finished off he with Poochie. He boxed yeah. him early. I didn't, didn't even know Poochie yeah. was a member. I think he boxed him twice before though. Uh, no, yeah, he, probably, he boxed was him it? before. Because that was famously the one where they said to him, they said to Curtis Woodhouse, oh, do you think he might be scared of you? And he's like, he's been to Iraq. You no, know, he's been to Afghanistan. He's not going to be scared of me. Yeah, I don't think it was their first fight. No, they boxed before. Oh, they boxed yeah, yeah. Poochie, yeah. how'd he get on? Uh, what else? One, didn't he? Must yeah, 40 36, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, fuck, I can't pronounce this geezer's name. Dick. Yeah. Right. Sisak Muagansuri. Yeah. You know that one? Nope. Muagansuri, right? He holds the record for the quickest boxer to become a world champion Not from really. turning pro, right? Yeah. He done it in just three fights. Can so he done it, I think Lomachenko done it in three fights, but he done it in less days, right? The Thai fighter wins a WBC world title, but which of the fabulous four stopped him in three rounds in 1979? Oh, fucking hell. He was, uh, a, hard, he was a hard fucker. I've been watching him on YouTube, but I've yeah. already... And he got stopped by one of the... I brutalized his name. So okay, that... I reckon um, stopped in three. Yeah. Roberto Duran. Nah. Oh. I'll pass it over. You've got, three, you've got one in three chance now. Leonard. No, it was, oh. it was Hearns. Oh. Oh. Right. <laughs> he done him in three. Brutal. Brutal. Right. What weight was he? What weight did he win the world title? Uh, I must have been probably well by then. Mm. Right. Mm. Number three. Who made what was described as an audacious move from lightweight to welterweight, daring to be great in 2019 to take on unbeaten champion Errol Spence Jr. in Vegas? From lightweight to welterweight. Yeah. You know this. I know you? it. You're under pressure. Oh, I know. Yeah. Are you were nodding. <laughs> I know because I lost. No, a, I lost a good bet on this. Mikey Garcia. Yeah, Mikey oh, Garcia. I remember backing Spence to stop him, and he didn't. Did he? it was points. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, I think he left behind yeah. the the IBF and WBC diamond belt at lightweight. Mm. Right. Okay. Those were the days. Right. Number four. Yeah. Roy Jones Jr. Yeah, I've heard of dared him. Dared to be great and succeeded, becoming the first middleweight world champion to win a heavyweight world title. Right. Yeah. He beat John Ruiz over 12 rounds in 2003. But which Brit did he beat prior to that? Defending his IBF, IBO, oh. IBA, WBA, WBC, and WBF world titles. Roy Jones? Yeah. Clinton Woods? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Number five, Pac-Man, Manny Pacquiao. Right, he won his first world title in 1998 in the, fly yeah, 1998 in the flyweight division, weighing 112 pounds, right? He dared to be great and conquer seven more divisions, eight in total. But what weight was his last world title win at? Ooh, Do you know what weight he finished up at? I think so. Welter? Yeah. 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 Keith Thurman. Keith Thurman, yeah. One time. Split. Yeah. Yeah. One time Thurman. Right. Got one right. He's on the board. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> in 19... If you don't get one right, you have to write a letter of apology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in 1991, which... Hollywood actor quit the industry, become a professional boxer. 91. Mm. Mm. Quite a big star. I have no idea. Do you know who the actor Anyone was? was? Quit. Rourke? Yes. Oh, that's quality. <laughs> yeah, I got two. Yes. yes. <laughs> Rourke, yeah. Mickey Rourke. He goes 6 0 and 2. 91, yeah. Yeah, three year career. I think he was trained by Freddie Roach. Mm. He's supposed to be a good amateur. Right. Number seven. Which of these Cuban fighters defected from native Cuba and made their professional debut first, Ooh. daring to be great in the professional ranks? Luis Ortiz, Rigondo, Gamboa. Gamboa. Yes. Oh. Yeah, two, April Very 2007. Good. Yeah. Rigondo was 2008. I think, I think um, Gamboa was, was uh, promoted by 50 Cent at the start as well. Was it at the start? Yeah, yeah. 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 Don't try and think of a 50 it in the cent club? pun. <laughs> See his brain ticking <laughs> over. Right. right. Usyk, the current heavyweight yeah. champion of the world, him. your former unified cruiserweight champion of Olympic champion and dared to be great going on the front line for his native Ukraine. Yeah. Right? During a war. Mm -hmm. right? But, um, Dek, I want to know, what is the name of his hairstyle oh. that he dared to be great with and sported? To show solidarity for South and East Ukrainians. It's the one with like the round bit. And it's just a bit long. of, yeah, a bit in the middle. 
you know what the name of the you, oh, you like must a, have wrote an article about it's it it's called like just the Cossack hairstyle or something like that it's of the Cossack yeah, traditional haircut of Cossacks oh. what's it called um trying not to offend anyone um <laughs> Is it? Is it? Would I get it? Is it? Is no. it no. <laughs> no, no, I don't know. And I reckon Steve doesn't know it either. No, I've got a clue. Well, what the, is it? Uh, I can't pronounce it. Oh, for fuck! Ossa de Lets. Well, how would I gonna get that? Ossa de Lets. Yeah, it's for his warrior people. You know, of the south, yeah. the yeah. Ukrainian I'm part. Of first. Yeah, yeah. Of the Ukrainian. Yeah. <laughs> the Ossa de Lets. It's that long, lonely lock yeah. in the middle. He got um, rid of that though recently, hasn't he? He doesn't yeah. do that anymore. I don't, the yeah, Ossa de Lets is gone. He shaved. It's shaved in the past. Yeah, it sort of changes. Well, there you go. You've been you've been trashed on 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 the feature. Really? I think I, surely I won that. He's, nah, you got the last one wrong. Well, Steve's three getting them right. He, he stole one of your answers. What? Okay, lovely. No, I'm not having that. I'm not having that. <laughs> got to, yeah. Okay. Have you done a tiebreaker? No. Oh, forget it. Uh, well, that's a good. I'll take a draw. Um, so what we what we got coming up then, Steve? So so we got been um, busy so far this year. Yeah, we got shows the next three weeks. Um, Biggest show's 23rd, got three three or four title fights on that. I've got Yusuf Kamari, another boxer that um, I'm looking after good talent. Good yeah, talent, but really I, good Yusuf Kamari. I mean, Yusuf's lovely. I, I managed him for three years, and then it's what happens. And so at the end of it, Dylan White come along and nicked him, um, obviously because he had the TV contract. So, But he was undefeated, Yusuf, with me. He went to Dylan White, all fell, went wrong for him. Mm, he lost to Reese Bellotti, didn't he? Yeah, he lost to yeah. Reese Bellotti. He shouldn't have, shouldn't have took the fight. He was forced to. Shouldn't have took the fight. There was no condition to do the fight. And um, he's back now. And he says, he says, if you're summer cap, you know, he's back home again. Mm. And I've got no problem because he left because I, I understood why he did it. But his grass wasn't greener and he's back now. And now we've got him in a final eliminator for the English. I'm just rebuilding him back up again to get back to where we need to be. So he's going to get a final eliminator for the English. He'll win the English title this summer. And then we'll be aiming for a British title next year. And then, back, and then what you said about TV, when we get to that level, then the TV companies will be interested in them again. Mm. So that's that's the highlight of this Saturday. And then I've got a few southern areas and English eliminators English uh, at the end of the month on the 23rd. So we're just building and building and building and building and building all the time. Mm. And tell us about the Box Mania concept. That's the new yeah. thing. So that was the idea was just to sort of elevate everything. Yeah, the so idea? basically the idea is every quarter, <clears throat> we, think boxing, we think that boxing as a whole, as a whole, the TV thing is pretty crap. As a whole, we don't think there's enough good quality boxing on TV. Now, what I mean by that, and I'm taking Saudi Arabia out of this, so if you get a traditional, and I'm taking the one at the O2 out of it as well, a traditional UK card, Macy, Caroline Dubois fighting a, a Mexican, winning 10 rounds to zero. Now, Caroline Dubois is supremely talented, but it's not really good television. You'll see the same on other shows. And you might look at a card and think, I could be bothered to watch it. Um, but the favourite in that's four on, the favourite in that's eight on, that's ten on, that's twelve on. Well, fights that are like that don't really appeal. So the objective of Box Mania was to try to put four to five of the fights, which is half of the fights, where bookmakers would really price them at four to five, four to six, mm. where they're really competitive fights. So as a concept we're developing. And the last time we had a Box Mania in December, we were told by, I think, Boxing News wrote, this is how you do it. Mm. And so the development is every quarter we're going to have a show like that. Now, we would have had a much bigger show on the 23rd, but because of Ramadan, our fighters that are in that religion had to stop fighting on the 9th of March. So a lot like Yusuf's fight would have been on the 23rd. So, but we're developing this. And our next one after this is June the 8th. And the objective will be we'll be trying to get five, six title fights on each show. So it's going to be elevated beyond any other small hall concept. The long term con the long term idea is to sell the box mania concept to one of the TV platforms. So they will turn around and say, Well, look, we would like to what we like boxing on a Sunday or a whatever they want to do, but take the concept of bringing really competitive fights where nobody knows who's going to win to TV. So the only thing to do is do something different. So we will then have some baby shows running, followed by the Box Mania cards. And the Box Mania have all the singing, all dancing production. That's where we spend more money. Mm. But the idea being that they will then be the, the younger kids who are coming through, if they sell good tickets, they get on the Box Mania show. If they do something special, they get on the Box Mania show. So the Box Mania shows, as we get to June, will be for those that have 
shown that they're more closer to TV as in the old days than they would be. So they, everybody means up, can I get on a Box Mania show? And that's what we're trying to achieve. Right. That, Do they get paid more for, unfortunately, being, unfortunately, for being in a harder fight? Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. So because, if you're in a 50-50 fight, you don't want to always have too many 50 Of course, fights because what you're getting there, you're getting like seven areas in English titles. So what you try to then do is that in those examples, they would share the ticket burden. So they would, they would all walk away with more money. Yeah. Clearly. So generally that would happen. Sometimes if you've got... So that, that's all the ones that are on the 23rd are all going to make reasonable money out of fighting. When I say reasonable, reasonable money for... They're not paying for their opponent because they're paying for themselves. Yeah, I mean, they? I'll get one guy on there who's doing a six rounder. He'll earn about 10,000 wow. on Box Mania. Mm. Um, so they get an opportunity to earn more money. There's the odd time where if you're fighting, say, a boxer's fighting, and you're doing Box Mania, let's say, and he's fighting for an English title, and we think that there's a soft touch, he may say, I'll bring that fighter down from Manchester and we'll have him. He's not going to sell tickets, but I'll happily sell more because... I know that I can sell a lot more tickets for this English title fight and I can still make good money. So you're always framing it that the fighter's got to get well paid out of it. And, mm. that can, and that does work. But if you get TV involved in some sort of format, which maybe they, they will do at some point, um, then that can then develop. The problem that you've got with, and I'm very much against this, is that there's a lot of stuff that's streamed for free. Now, I've seen the Box Nation are coming back doing small boxing. Mm. But I would imagine, and I'll, I'll hope to be proven wrong, they won't be giving piles of money to it. And we're offered so, we've been offered so many times to stream our shows, but if there's no money, <clears throat> what's the point? Because the boxers are going to lose ticket sales, the promoters are going to lose ticket sales, so what's the point? So the idea being we would like paid revenue so that the boxers can get better mm. pay. Mm. Yeah. But that's the concept, but you've got to develop a concept over a period of time to make it work. So mm. Box Mania is a, is a concept, and we're going to develop it, and we're going to be pitching it to, to corporate companies and to TV stuff in the end. That's the idea. Lauren, Parker, Lauren Parker's fight, that was on the last box. Man, that was on box, yeah. yeah. yeah that was, I was amazing. That yeah, was. yeah. So big opportunities for, for your fighters as well on those cards. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's title opportunities. It's, it's the level where after that they can look at TV. On the last box mania card, I can't say too much yet, one of them is now likely to get... Um, a TV, we've just been in negotiations for a TV fight for them on the back of their win at Box Mania. Nice. So there are opportunities for them. And that's what you're doing. So it does help them progress to that, that level that they want to get to. And that's, that's the aim. Mm. Incredible. We need one more thing, George. Yeah, we do. So Steve, we ask each and every one of our guests to give us what would be their ring walk track if they were to fight under the, under the bright lights of your call. What would be your track that you would be ring walking to? We know you've, you've, sat, you've sat ringside yeah. for probably thousands of fights <laughs> and probably thought, I could do better than this <laughs> in terms of music. And, and I want to know venue as well. Has it got to be your call for you? Got to be your call. Yeah, that's where Josh Box, wasn't it? Yeah. That was a pro debut. Your call, what's the tune? It's quite a small ring walk, that. It is. I would probably, I would probably come into halfway through the song, Phil Collins in the air tonight. Okay, nice. There you go, yes. Yeah. It's not on there, is it? Is, is it, it snuck on? I don't it might it have. We might have pitched it, but I don't think anyone else has picked it. Mm. That's a great and track. It, yeah, it's a great tune. And if so, at your call, would you do the, the walk in from the side door or would you set something up on the stage? No, stage. That's you what do we the do stage for the main things, yeah. Straight so, down how the my ring walk would be, this is how it would be. That's how I did it for Lauren Parker. We would have the video, the, you'd have the video on stage of me training and doing stuff, which is what we do. And then you'd, and you have one song on for there. So, Lauren had a ring walk, but we had that on stage. So, you had all the people cheering for us in a, picture and stuff like that before and then she ring walks after that so there was right. two there were two songs in the ring walk in effect okay and that was really cool. that was really cool lovely straight down the middle and into the ring perfect yeah. with the screen oh, behind that screen behind yeah yeah beautiful well that we'll, we'll, we'll sort that out for your debut because you know what you asked for in this club <laughs> that's, that's what you get yeah um steve that was a, that was amazing we, yeah, we waited a long time for a small hall explanation yes and we've, we've got, got it. it i think we got Cleared it. it up it's not an easy easy job is it no. but it's a job you love because you just it's in that 5%, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. Yeah. So My the, wife knows that rule. I always tell her that's the rule. 95-5. That, that sounds yeah. like this podcast, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> a few ibuprofen. Yeah. And it's all fine. <laughs> Steve Goodwin, thank you very much. Pleasure. Cheers, pal.